Hello, uh, welcome to the Somerville Media Center's panel discussion about arts organizations in the time of COVID-19. I'm Julie Taliesin, uh, the reporter and editor for the Somerville Journal. Um, you might know me from some of the weekly roundups that we've done. And I'll be moderating the discussion between our five distinguished panelists. Um, this panel is produced as part of SMC's Community Media Week. So after you watch this, you should definitely go and check out some of the other stuff they have lined up. Um, and this panel is meant to highlight the many challenges faced by arts and creative organizations in Somerville. Um, the, you know, the business interruptions brought about by COVID have been nothing short of devastating. Um, so today we're gonna to hear from panelists about how they've adjusted operations and development, um, as well as their concerns and thoughts about where we go from here. Um, so with that, let's dive in. Um, so I'd like to just start by asking each panelist to introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about how COVID has impacted you or your organization. Um, so why don't we start off with Stephanie? You wanna go first? Great, thanks so much, Julia. Thanks for the opportunity to um, be on the program today. Well, let's see, um, I'm the executive director over at the Center for Arts at the Armory on Highland Ave, and I've been in my role for a little bit over a year now. Um, so it's been um, quite a year. Um, <laughs> first, we uh, had a big leadership transition, and then that was more or less in, in November um, when my predecessor, Leah Ruscio, who many of you um, know, uh, stepped down from her role. And um, then in March, um, precisely March 13th, um, we um, COVID hit um, and we made the decision to um, based on you know city state uh, mandates that we would not be able to hold um, events in our performance hall or in our cafe. Um, so, and we have not held really um, anything um, to date until this point, um, up until today. Um, and I don't know when we will be able to going forward. Um, we did um, do a, a creative pivot um, and on July 21st, we reopened with Rooted Armory uh, Cafe and Farm Stand. So the idea of that, we did a new menu and um, we're really trying to feature uh, Somerville Winter Farmers Market vendors products, um, both um, as a grocery, um, a small grocery and farm stand, and then also um, via our, our new menu. So um, I don't wanna take up too much time, but it has been a significant financial impact on um, on our organization, um, we put in a skeleton, a sort of administrative staff um, from about mid-March to mid-July. Through reopening with Rooted, we have been able to bring back about 75% of our staff. Um, we have been applying for and, and received a PPP loan. We're hopeful um, that we might get an EIDL loan. Um, we've been doing fundraising and the community has been very supportive and we really, really appreciate um, the community's support both in terms of fundraising and in um, coming, coming to Rooted. So I'm sure we'll get more in depth into to different things um, later in the program, but that's kind of a high level synopsis of, of where we've been over the past seven months. Definitely, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, Lynn, do you wanna take it next? Hi, my name is Lynn Gervins. I'm the executive director of Mudflat Pottery School. We're in East Somerville at 81 Broadway. And um, pre-COVID, we, um, we had a robust program of pottery classes for adults, kids, and teens. About 325 adults taking classes with us every semester. Um, doing lots of community outreach programming, and we have a gallery space in Porter Square that highlights the work of the artists who work here at Mudflat. Um, Mudflat is a 49-year-old organization. Um, I've been here 40 years, <laughs> so um, and um, things are certainly changed, and I, I can go into more of that later on. But um, we uh, we have reopened with some classes now, um, but it's been a significant hit for us, as it has for every organization as well. And um, things are, are not the same yet and won't be for a long time. But um, I think, you know, the biggest things we're kind of missing right now were we missed out on our spring sale with Somerville Open Studios. Looks like we're not gonna have a holiday sale like we always do. And those are things that make us really miss the greater community around, you know, what's happening at Muff, here at Mudflat. Gotcha, thank you so much, Lynn. Um, Lars, do you wanna take it away next? 
It's wonderful to see colleagues. Um, we don't have a, often enough the opportunity to step back and really kind of assess where we're all at together. So thank you for helping us do that. Artisans Asylum, we are a 42,000 square foot maker space in Somerville. We're on Tyler Street. Uh, if folks are familiar with um, Star Market, we are very close to, or excuse me, Market Basket. We're very close to that. Um, and we have about 600 members. And um, you know, having a socially transmitted disease or a disease that thrives in social spaces is an absolute killer for an organization like ours. And I would imagine for many arts organizations where our basic value proposition turns on bringing people together. So try to imagine any business, right? A restaurant or what have you, where, you know, your basic proposition is that you're bringing people together to share an experience that went flat. And we obviously had to pivot like many organizations to understand um, what's our business model short term to get through this. And then if we're gonna be living with COVID for the rest of our lives or another five years, whatever that is, how do we adapt and survive? And so we spent a lot of time um, thinking through those dilemmas. Um, we've made some changes to our business model, things like education, where classes are a big part of what we do, like Lynn um, at Mudflat and others. Um, so. It's safe to say that COVID-19 has impacted every level of our business, how our board operates, down to the level of what kind of access to a studio does one of our members have? And so I'll look forward to unpacking that with everybody. Um, but yes, it has been huge. So thanks for bringing us together to talk about it. Thank you so much. Um, Susan, you want to take it? I'm Susan Bursler. I'm the director of the Nave Gallery. We're a little bit different in terms of our business model than the people who just spoke. We're all volunteer. We're a nonprofit. We exist um, mostly because of the um, kindness of the Clarendon Hill Presbyterian Church, who um, give us space in their church that's up near Tufts on Powderhouse Boulevard. Um, it, it's been really hard though. I, I think I really like what Lars had to say about the lack of community. Uh, I mean, meeting through Zoom or whatever other online space that somebody's created is not the same as interacting and collaborating and working with people in person. And our gallery space is about um, collaboration. It's about projects, it's about group projects. Um, we very rarely have solo shows, really what we, often do is have a, a guest curator who comes in with a theme and a number of artists who work around whatever that idea is behind it. And um, I think one of the strengths of our space is the way we all learn from each other and work with each other and become further on down the line, you know, collaborators with each other. And that's really, really hard to do in a digital space. Um, it, we don't have quite the financial burden because we've shut down, so we're not spending money right now um, like we normally do, uh, and we're not paying a huge rent or mortgage, but um, there's a lot of logistics about us reopening that we haven't quite figured out yet. Um, there's a daycare in the building, and so they're very very worried about people coming in from the outside and limiting access. Um, there's shared restrooms. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of little things we need to work out before we can talk about opening. Um, but I guess more importantly, we need also people to feel comfortable to want to come back into that space to have conversations and community with each other. And I'm not hearing that from people out there. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing that there's a need to do it because we need to reopen, but I'm not really hearing people say I'm comfortable reopening yet, so. Got it, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and finally, Charles, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Charles Baldwin and I am a, a resident of the Brick Bottom Artist Building. Um, like Susan, Brick Bottom is a little different. Uh, it was founded 30 plus years ago as an artist cooperative, a collective. And of course, real estate has changed a lot over the 30 years. So uh, the Brick Bottom Artists Association is primarily a group of artists who live in or without outside of Brick Bottom, but is primarily an artist driven association. So we have a, a, a gallery on site which is, again, a little different because we're in a private 
building. Uh, and we also have a huge open studios, which uh, would be occurring in November. And so the biggest change is <clears throat> because the BAA and Brick Bottom is really just a, a small volunteer board and vol more volunteers running it, um, the open studios has been canceled. Um, the BAA does have one staff member, uh, Deb Olin, who is the curator, uh, but the gallery, because it sits within a private building, uh, is also not open yet. Uh, we've got plans, but uh, it, it has changed. And in many ways, it's remained activated because it's, uh, artists have used it as a maker space where there's still distance, but using it to initially make masks and other uh, resources. And now some people just use it, again, just to have creative uh, collegiality. Um, but the biggest change is the cancellation of open studios, which is a huge, um, uh, huge part of the neighborhood, which is, you know, one of those up and coming neighborhoods, although it's really an island over in East, ba in East Somerville. Uh, and for all the artists who have continually participated in it for more than 30 years. So I would add the biggest change that we found as we try to gather and remain com a community on Zoom is really the, the mental and physical health of our membership um, in reaction to uh, COVID, um, isolation, and the ability, how, how do you share and how do you build community in these spaces? Amazing. Thank you so much. I, I think you've all you've all touched on some really great things and especially um, just the limitations um, that are just happen when we can't gather and we can't just come together as a community and as an artist community. Um, so actually on that kind of subject, I want to kick it to back to Stephanie a little bit. Um, we had the opportunity to speak a little while ago about the arts impact petition that was being circulated to request more support from the city. I'm just sure many of you know about that. Many of you were signers on that letter. Um, so then when we were chatting about that, um, we spoke about events. And I, I would love to hear from you a little bit about um, I mean, as a journalist in Somerville who just kind of goes around covering things, I'm well aware that the Armory is a hub. It is a hub for so much that goes on in the city. Um, so can you kind of speak about um, kind of what the impact is of not being able to host all those events? How many events do you usually host? And then kind of um, without them, you began kind of speaking about it with Rooted, but how how have you pivoted to support the organization in the absence of, in the absence of all of that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it is, it is such a challenge. Um, so at the Center for Arts at the Armory, um, we do 750 events or more. I don't even know really how we count them. It's, um, you know, every, every, every day of the week, um, we, you know, we have something going on um, in the cafe or the performance hall. So, you know, really serving thousands of people um, in Somerville and the greater Boston area and beyond, um, you know, every year. So it is, um, in, like others have said, I mean, it's really about um, bringing people together through the arts to be inspired, empowered, transformed. That is the nature of what we do. And so what does that look like um, in, you know, during times of COVID? And, um, you know, I, I think one of the silver linings of this um, experience has been um, the opportunity to come together um, with uh, colleagues, many of, you know, colleagues that are part of this this call today and especially for me as I was a, a newcomer to the uh, the landscape over um, in Somerville um, to get to know my colleagues and to really brainstorm collectively and to do advocacy um, I'm sure many have heard that we've had some great results with the city of Somerville so far in terms of funds being um, allocated um, for COVID relief um, and, you know, there's been different offshoots um, as a result of these, you know, different Zoom meetings and advocacy groups. Um, right now, I'm part of a group um, with Greg Jenkins, the director of the Somerville Arts Council and um, other city officials and some other um, leaders of, of different spaces in Somerville trying to think through the question of like, what does reopening look like for the arts? And um, I don't, you know, we're gonna, as a group, collectively look at that. Um, what could that look like in public spaces outdoors? 
what does that look like potentially um, in like out, outdoors at the armory? Um, what does that potentially look like indoors? Um, in I think it would have to be in a later phase in like phase, um, I guess it's phase three, step two. Um, and I don't know. I don't know. Again, I don't know what the answers are. Um, I, you know, I think there's been some frustration because a uh, window was lost during the, um, the summer months. Um, we're very restricted in terms of zoning at the armory and we were not able to do much at all, except for we were allowed to do a farmer's market in the parking lot. But um, other than that, we couldn't do anything more. We did get outdoor seating, um, a permit to do outdoor seating, um, but we, we were denied a um, entertainment license. So I was hoping to just be able to do like, um, you know, a solo dance performance outdoors, solo theater, acoustic, you know, guitar, you know, simple stuff. But I just thought that that would really be something that would be appreciated by, um, you know, by the community and also employ artists. Um, so I, you know, still hoping to do something along those lines. Um, I am also, now that we've got Rooted, I already spoke about Rooted, you know, up and running, I'm starting to look at um, what could we offer? We've gotten some inquiries um, and we have done one event to date. Um, we've done a couple of blood drives um, and um, we did have Esh Circus Arts in the space on Saturday. They did a filming um, and we've gotten a couple of other inquiries um, more from for-profit companies that want to do um, filmings in the space. Um, and so I'm trying to you know, think and work with staff to put together some type of offering to allow that would allow groups um, to come into the space to do um, a recording, a filming, potentially, you know, we have to look at our technical um, sound capacity, how good the acoustics would be for like an audio recording, but that's something that we're, we're looking into um, and just trying to work with the city and say like, you know, hey, this is, these are some events that we could do at a reduced capacity. Um, are we allowed to do this or not? Um, so there's been quite a few, um, you know, the HASP plan, which is, oh, I guess it's the HASP, I should say the health and safety plan. And, you know, many of those that have gone back and forth um, and, you know, just trying to see what's possible. We are looking to have a, a pre-order um, farmer's market um, that would start up December 5th, but the community would come and pick up their items at the armory. So also looking at that. But I think ultimately, I mean, something that I really question is like, you know, is this really viable? Like why, you know, trying to do um, arts events in this um, in this environment? I mean, yes, it, it, you know, if we serve 20 people and that they, they really benefit from it, great, I'm all for it. But we also have to look at, you know, financially, like, is this like, is this really, um, is this really feasible? So I think there's just so many questions. Um, and, you know, I know that I, I am happy to be working on those questions with a lot of different people in Somerville. And I don't necessarily have the answers today, but I hope we have um, something to offer, um, you know, soon. Got it. Thank you so much for sharing, Stephanie. Those are crushing questions <laughs> to be considering, like important ones. Um, yeah, so still kind of, um, I guess, kind of on the subject of gathering um, and just art, I, I had a question for Susan about this, um, that kind of with so many restrictions on gathering, um, like, at, you know, kind of in the gallery world, how how do people view and interact with art shows? And um, I'm curious, kind of it, it, with Nave, have you changed your 2020, 2021 programs at all to kind of fit those restrictions or to kind of subvert them or kind of how have you, how have you been managing that? Um, we have put all of our programming on hold and we've started moving things online. Um, we just received some money from the city, from the 
arts funding that the mayor made available that's going to allow us to move the Somerville Toy Camera Festival, which is something that we normally do together with Washington Street and with Brick Bottom. We've also had the Somerville Museum involved. We've had the Griffin Museum of Photography in Winchester involved and the Photographic Resource Center in Cambridge involved. So it's huge. I mean, we usually have about 100 artists. And this year, I think we got submissions from about 30 different countries, including India. It was the first time I ever got a toy camera submission from India. So we needed some money for some infrastructure to be able to put, we're going to have three online exhibits chosen by three separate jurors. So that's going to be fun. And that's been where we've been putting our focus right now. Um, I mean, I think that's great because when we go back to when hopefully we can all meet in person in an actual physical gallery space, we'll still have the infrastructure on the website to be able to do these sort of online exhibitions, either in conjunction with or separately. And I, I like that because it does allow people from all over the world um, to participate, kind of like what just happened with Honk last week with the Honk United. I mean, that was crazy. The fact that they got a ban from Antarctica to be able to play as part of the festival was just like amazing and wonderful, right? So that's the positive part about this. The negative part about it is like with Honk again, as an example, my Wi-Fi is so bad in my house that half the time when I went to watch something, I couldn't really watch it. So, um, it's hard. Um, I, we're rethinking our, our programming. I th I'm personally very cautious. I know people who've, um, I've lost family and friends because of COVID. Um, I'm not in a hurry to put a bunch of people in a space that I feel responsible for, where people could potentially get infected or pass you know, infection on to people. So I'm starting to think about whether we can make it available to, um, in the past, we've sometimes had artist residencies in the space. So one person's in there. And then when they finish whatever it is they're doing, maybe make it available on a very limited um make a reservation in advance where you can come in and see what it's doing. So we're getting to where we're starting to think about that. We're still not anywhere near thinking we're going to have a big group show. We're going to have a lot of people to come celebrate. Um, I, I, I just, I don't really feel comfortable doing that right now. Got it. Thank you so much for sharing. That's really interesting that um, that's so cool about the, the camera from India. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, Awesome. Um, so I guess, um, who am I going to kick it to next? Um, Lars, um, I, I feel like Artisans Asylum um, is so much. Um, I, I visited once and it was it was a workspace. It was a gallery. It's a classroom space. It's it's so many things. Um, and with so many artists working in, I'm going to say it again, so many mediums that I, I'm just curious, um, how have you navigated um, any sort of reopening when it comes to classes, when it comes to just artists working in their own spaces um, with such a diverse portfolio of artists? How have you done that? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess I'll start with a little bit of a prehistory to how we've doing it, because I don't think we could have done it as successful as we had if we didn't have the prehistory. And that prehistory is that because Artisans is largely a community of innovators and doers, we very quickly realized because there was this gap in the local supply of PPE that we could help fill that gap. So we applied for um, an exemption through the state, through through the Baker administration to be able to stay open for the production of PPE, right? So this gave us kind of like a unintentional test bed for our policies, our procedures, things like this, right? So we had a much, much limited, much more limited user base, but we could test things out and bounce ideas off that user base as we were lining up production facilities for PPE, principally, you know, the face shields and the gowns. Um, so that helped us a lot. And I have to say the other really big win for us, and I'm very grateful that uh, we're doing this work in Massachusetts, the, the clarity of the leadership coming from the Baker administration that then pushed down 
through the ranks of, um, you know, Mayor Curtitoni and certainly Mayor Walsh um, was really helpful in setting expectations, right? I think we had a little bit of movement in those timelines, but having this phase reopening to kind of look toward, to skate toward, that's like where the puck's going to be, as they always say. So we could anticipate that as the runway that we needed to get up to speed on in order to be successful. And again, we didn't quarterback the science behind these policies. We sort of really left that to the state policymakers to say, based on the best available information, this is what we recommend. And we really kind of took that as our operating system, if you will. So from there, I would say that there were a couple of ways that we really had to um, look at um, wrangling <laughs> this vast and sprawling group of, of free, free-willed thinkers into some kind of cooperative framework so we don't get ourselves sick, right? Um, the good thing is it's a terrifying disease. We don't fully understand it. Information was evolving every week aerosolization versus surface transmission, all these questions, right? So, you know, in retrospect, we can look at, oh, wow, those were kind of silly sanitation practices. But in actuality, they were a response to the best available information that we had. So we had four levels of sort of response that we had to universalize, generalize across our facility. The first one is just policy and governance, right? What's our policy going to be because that's really going to indicate good, bad behavior in out type of relationship with the organization. So we could set that policy framework. The second one was really going to be around then um, infrastructure. What infrastructure changes do we need to make to ensure that we are delivering on that policy framework that we've identified? Then the sort of the third area that I would identify is socialization of that. How do we communicate? this stuff in such a way that members um, have real buy-in and that we are sort of operating as a community. I can tell you that there were things like wearing name tags that really got some people riled up. Like we live in the age of Reddit, libertarianism, whatever, asking people to wear a name tag turns out to be a lot more uh, controversial than maybe I would have expected. So learning a lot along the way and changing your policies and adapting them to achieve the outcomes, which is, you know, hey, how do you say hi to somebody when you can't really see their face? I mean, we have people who come on with sunglasses, hats, and a mask. You tell me who that is, that's Bob or Idris or whomever, right? So lots of learning going on there. Um, and then I think the fourth area um, was really, and it goes under, um, the governance piece, but is the decision-making process. It couldn't just be me dictating stuff, right? We had to have some level of assurance that these policies that we are asking members to conform to come from um, the, the collective best thinking of some group of people. So we stood up a health and safety committee that then uh, was really responsible for um, enshrining um, you know, making decisions and then enshrining those decisions in our policy. And I think those four levels of sort of activity really helped. Some of the examples of what we had to do to then change in each of these areas was, you know, in order for members to be able to return, they had to agree, they had to sign off on a health and safety covenant kind of thing, right? It's guidelines, but basically you have to sign, you have to agree to behave this way. If you don't, we have the right to kick you out. So that was kind of important. Um, so there's the policy and, and getting members on board um, prior to coming in. Um, that impacted then other downstream changes to, for example, occupancy limits. We eliminated, we're still not open to the public in the sense that we're not doing public tours, we're not doing group classes, things like that. However, we had to look at our shops, for example, the wood shop. Often you might have eight people working in there and that's 900 square feet. So that's hundred square foot per person, basically. That's not enough. So we had to like do the math, figure out the calculations. What's the appropriate um, occupancy level for that space? And again, this is where guidance from the state was really helpful. And eventually that came down through Mayor Curtitoni's office as well, looking at things like air exchanges, how much air is being exchanged in that space and how long should people linger there? because of the aerosolization of COVID-19. So we looked at those and we came up with numbers, then we created occupancy limits based on those. Another good example is we removed 
social gathering spaces. It hurts. That's the heart of who we are. And yet to have a minimal viable product, we needed people to be able to come in and feel generally safe. We weren't creating pockets of aerosolized COVID-19. So we took our social spaces, divided them up into individual workspaces, for example. Um, and I guess, you know, there's then the basic things like everybody wears a mask. You're not wearing a mask, you're not coming in. We encourage um, frequent hand washing. We have sanitizing stations throughout in every shop. Uh, we've increased airflow by adding big fans throughout the space. And all of this is largely environmental changes to our infrastructure. We haven't had to go in and say, all right, because this is the casting shop, we need to do something different. We just kind of looked at the floor size and the calculation and we said, all right, well, let's figure out what the maximum occupancy can be. And it's one, you know, for something like the casting shop. So it's basically closed. Wow, thank you so much for taking us through that in detail. It's, it's really interesting to hear all of the things that go into kind of making this possible, <laughs> making it possible for people to use this space. Yeah, and I really want to emphasize that even though from a cash perspective, it's been hard to stay open, from a policy leadership perspective, having the Baker administration, the Curtitoni administration, the Walsh administration pushing good information out to us in a timely way has been a huge support. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, doesn't solve the cash problems, those are there. Um, but when you just look at what's happening nationally, it's remarkable and I'm very proud of it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about funding. Um, so Lynn, I'm gonna kick it to you. Um, so I guess um, kind of as the ED at Mudflat, um, what kind of concerns did you have about funding at the beginning of the shutdown? Um, and what, if anything, has changed? Like, are, are you still kind of seeing the same issues? Um, are you seeing everything that you thought kind of come to pass? Um, and what kind of, what are you guys doing to navigate it? So I think, th thanks, Julie. I think to start, I just want to reiterate some of what Lars said that, you know, we did a lot of those same kind of thinking and putting policies and protocols in place that have been really helpful in terms of sharing that information with the people who are coming to Mudflat. We have 38 studio artists who have studios here. Um, and so just all of us being on the same page about what our expectations were and what those protocols were going to be so that we could all be safe. That was sort of the most important thing for anybody walking in the building. Um, I think in terms of funding, most of Mudflat's um, income is earned um, through tuitions from classes and workshops. And so when we had to cancel our spring summer semester in its entirety, um, that was represented about a $300,000 loss for us in tuition. Um, and that's, we're not going to make that up. <laughs> um, just even opening, reopening this um, August with a couple of things, programming for limited numbers of people, and then off doing some programming now this fall. Um, we're running at about 35 to 40% of capacity from before. Um, and that's basically due to a lot of those space limitations that we can only have so many people in the classroom and we need to think about um, you know, what, that, um, what that's gonna look like with a teacher coming in and how uh, we, can't, we did cancel all of our kids programming and all of our introductory workshops so that we could limit the number of people coming into the building. But um, that 30 to 40% capacity represents uh, represents a financial loss as well. And so we're trying to, when we did um, the, over the summer and now this fall, we're also offering some virtual workshops and classes um, to try to reach people um, who, as Susan was talking about, people who may not be comfortable coming in the building, but we don't wanna leave those community members behind. So we're offering those kinds of options for people to still participate. Although working in clay is really about, you know, having a, equipment, the potter's wheel, the kilns. And so some of that has been difficult for people and doesn't really make up for that lack of being able to come in the building. Um, we, um, I think, you know, we've also, uh, we're just looking at more online options. So we have this gallery space in Porter Square, which represents the work of about 40 of our artists. And uh, that was closed as well until um, probably middle of July is when that reopened, but it's still not open at 
of the scheduling that we had before. We've only hired back four of those employees. Um, all the rest are still furloughed. And so, you know, we're trying to look at what, what we can do to help support our artists as well. So we've started doing some online uh, shop uh, that features a different theme every month. And that we've had a good response to that, which has been encouraging. Um, it's not the same as going into a store and picking up a piece of pottery and taking it home in your bag, but um, it means that some people can still have that access that they wouldn't have had before. And I think the other thing that I could say about like the virtual classes is that we had people from the West Coast and Canada who um, and, and uh, countries overseas who signed up for those classes who would never have taken a class class or workshop with us before. So it was it was a way to kind of expand our reach and broaden our community as well, which was really encouraging. Um, I think in terms of right now, I'm working on our budget for 2021 <laughs> and I'm running a lot of different scenarios um, because we of the uncertainty of we don't know what's gonna happen. And um, so, and we did this for 2020 as well. Like what if we can't open till June? What if we can't open till September? Um, so we're looking at all that as well to see about, you know, how we can maintain our facility. We own our building and we have a mortgage. And also, um, you know, how do we slowly bring back more students, more faculty in the safest way possible? So trying to pay attention to all those different things um, as, as other people have already spoken about. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, that's a lot to cover. Um, so actually, yeah, speaking to um, kind of how artists have managed this, Charles, I'd love to hear a little bit from you um, about how um, independent artists or, or, you know, artists in communities are kind of navigating this moment and what resources you are turning to or re what resources you find they are turning to or what resources are available for them to turn to. So I would love to hear your perspective on that. Well, uh, you know, I actually moved to Brick Bottom just in January. I'm a theater artist. And when this hit, um, I have a sort of a, you know, let's just do it kind of attitude. And I think people were, again, shocked, surprised and traumatized. So that one of the first things that um, getting together with the BAA, what we did was to try to connect to each other in these virtual realms. So uh, not only were we meeting in small groups, but we were trying to meet more regularly and getting the word out to hear from each other um, so that it wasn't a small group making one decision, but really responding to how artists were uh, feeling. Um, and this is why I say it was both a physical and mental uh, issue where, uh, again, you, you know, you, you might be familiar with working in isolation, but at some point you're going to show off the work when the show off the work wasn't necessarily happening easily. So the first resource was to really look within and within ourselves so that we were able to uh, respond to the immediate needs. Um, we did decide early uh, based on listening to the the state, listening to the city, uh, to we didn't want to call it canceling open studios. We wanted to call reimagining because we couldn't really imagine them happening in November, which was when they would traditionally occur. Um, and again, listening to people so that it wasn't just a small group making the decision, but rather a large group. Um, with that decision, then came what do our what do we need as individual artists what uh so that's when uh we really we turn to social media so that brick bottom has a greater presence on facebook and on instagram um we certainly turn to uh the gallery space itself while closed to the public became an area again where artists three or four artists were able to be in that space at the same time working and creating. So that level of isolation was being fought. Um, and it's in listening to artists uh, talking about how do we monetize or value uh, through these virtual uh, displays, through uh, uh, digital open studios. And we have, our artists have had sales, which is great. Um, so with all of this sort of roiling and trying to remain connected, whether we've had a speaking program or just a, a community social meeting, um, 
because we are pretty much volunteer run, uh, it's been slower than some might want. And I think uh, the sense of urgency, which comes from a lot of other sources, is something to uh, to fight when we're thinking about our own uh, mental health of ourselves and our community. Um, we will be opening up the gallery uh, uh, in November, following protocols, setting up a plan. Um, Deb Olin, as I said, we've got a great uh, show going in um, and we want to be able to measure our impact. Uh, we also applied for and got a small grant from the Somerville Arts Council so that we could have a designated person um, help us reimagine and reinvent the open studios, which we'd like to do in uh, May, corresponding with the Somerville Open Studios, so that, again, we can kind of build with each other. So I, I would say the biggest thing that we've been doing is trying to create a network and a coalition of artists so that uh, we empower our very plurality. That's sort of been our big thing. I love that, empower our plurality. That's a wonderful phrase. Um, thank you all so much. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of kick out some general questions. Um, I know that that can sometimes be a little weird in the Zoom format, um, but just kind of, if you wanna answer, just kind of unmute yourself, jump in and we'll navigate it. Um, so I think generally, um, this is kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier about the kind of um, petition for art support. Um, I'm curious to hear from you um, what you think the city, the state, um, and or the kind of federal government should be doing to support arts organizations. Um, if there's good actions taking place that you think should be built upon, please share that as well. But I, I'd love to hear from you what action, what further actions you think should be taken at the moment. Because I think sometimes that uh, the arts are seen as a line item and are not actually considered how much we actually are involved in everything. Art, design, cultural practice, um, you know, this shouldn't just be a single line item that's getting support. It needs, I think it needs a greater awareness. And I also think that it needs to be seen not just as a one-on-one -on -one exchange, but really a, a, a web of threads because we do touch and connect so many other industries. Um, we could toss around the phrase creative economy a lot, but I think that it is actually uh, bigger and broader than that one phrase hits. So as far as support goes, I think uh, there should be more intentional support. It's nothing that the city of Somerville can solve. It's nothing that the state of Massachusetts can solve. It really should come from the federal level. We really need a new deal project the way they had in 1935 or whenever that was. And it shouldn't just be visual art. It should go into performing arts and everything else. Um, and it has to come. I mean, it's huge. If you look at what's happening in other countries, um, Berlin's a great example. You know, they're give, they gave out grants, significant amount of grants, went to people who just create events. I can't see that happening here right now. And um, I, I'm incredibly grateful to Mayor Curtitone and what the city of Somerville is doing for the arts, but it's a little bit of money compared to what the need is. And the need is so great across so many different sectors of our population, not just the arts, that I understand that they don't have more money for us, but it really, I, we're a vital part of what makes you know, what makes this country what it is? And it needs to be supported and it needs to, um, you know, we need to be here in 10 years. Our spaces need to be here and our artists need to be here. Thank you, does ever, anyone else wanna? Well, I'll just uh, jump in quickly. I, I also agree with um, that with what Charles and Susan just said, and I was really encouraged on a local level by the conversations that we had at the last Arts Town Hall with Mayor Grutoni and the response that they gave us to a lot of our questions. It doesn't answer all, all the problems that we're having, but um, some of it seems to be a step in the right direction. And they certainly were, um, they and some of the councilors, city councilors were very, um, um, fluent in their uh, support of the arts in Somerville and the value that the arts bring to this community. So I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that as we continue to have 
two more town arts town hall meetings later this year, that there will we'll be able to move this conversation forward and um, see some real action. I was just gonna yeah. add, um, I mean, I think that a crisis like this really exposes how fragile the sector is. And, um, you know, I think a lot of our advocacy efforts um, are really positive because, you know, one thing that we've been talking about is a cultural plan for Somerville. So how do we emerge from this? Hopefully if we survive, um, <laughs> how do we emerge from it and sort of build back better, so to, so to speak? Um, and, you know, what is required? And, and at this time, I mean, something, and that's something that I'm working on at the Center for Arts at the Armory is um, so much of our revenue is tied up in events and I'm trying to build our fundraising portfolio and so that we're not so reliant on, on earned income from, from events. But um, because of that and because, you know, we can't do events with COVID, I mean, it's just devastated us um, financially. And I think it really, um, and I just want to recognize what um, what a jump it's been for the city of Somerville in announcing, you know, six hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars available in the COVID relief fund. Um, that pool of money, I think, I, I don't know the history, but I, I of what the levels of funding in, in the past have been, but I know that it is a significant jump, um, you know, from. Um, from what's been done previously. So I think it's a great start and I wanna acknowledge that, but I think just like Susan said, in terms of um, city, state and federal government, um, there really needs to be uh, major um, attention put on this issue for our sector, both organizations and individuals. Um, there's a movement afoot, uh, Save Our Stages, and the fact that, you know, venues like Arts at the Armory and, and Once, I mean, we will be, um, we were the first to close and we will be the last um, to open. So it's, um, how do we get through this and, um, and survive this? And I think the government has a really significant role to play and there's you know in other countries and i think even in san francisco they just announced that artists could get a 500 dollars monthly um stipend um for for the i guess it's for the year or something i don't have the exact details but those types of things i mean we really have to start really looking at them yeah and i'll add that um i think that there's a huge coordination gap that's happening and that's in part driven by a lack of information. And one of the things that's been really powerful to see states doing and municipalities is trying to inventory, what is the state of crisis, right? Because good data should be the basis of decision-making. So I really value that folks are trying to unpack this crisis at a grassroots level. What's the individual impact? What's the organizational impact? What's the system impact? What's the impact on the ecosystem? So I think that there will be an emerging opportunity for what I would call sort of multi-stakeholder or collective impact models to address this. Um, I'm more cynical than maybe some others on this call. I don't think the answer is gonna come from government. I think the answer is gonna come when we are able to influence a stronger partnership between government and foundations and the private sector. And part of that case making is gonna be on us. There is, we are just, I wish as much as, as, as anybody that we were Germany, that we were France, that we had these sort of, you know, municipal, you know, and, and federal filmmaking funds, all kinds of gaps. That's not gonna come out of COVID, but what can come out of COVID are networks, like exactly the one that this group has built to then press upon Somerville Arts Council to unleash new resources. And what's missing right now is connecting those resources to private sector support. Those resources, every grant that we got, thank you, City of Somerville, should be leveraged by private sector donations as well, right? We should be amplifying this support. And so I think there's a real opportunity for strengthening our work together as a network and then expecting more multi-sector collaboration to ensure that the arts emerge out of this stronger, more intact, and with um, even greater prospects to heal society, to inspire society than we might have had prior to going into this crisis. 
Thank you so much, Lars. Um, that kind of reminds me of, uh, I don't know if any of you saw this meme or just this thing that was being thrown around at the beginning um, about how like arts are saving all of you. Like, you know, we're listening to podcasts, we're watching TV, we're playing, we're doing puzzles, we're coloring in coloring books, we're taking up embroidery. That's my thing. <laughs> like we're just doing all this stuff to get through this. And what is that? It's, it's the arts and creativity. I think I think that's a powerful framework and it's unmeasured right now, but Charles was talking earlier about mental health. And I think if we go back and we do some quarterbacking here on the powerful impact of technology and the arts and just even the arts, the busker on the street playing a beautiful set of tones on that guitar, those effects are powerful because they remind us that even in a pandemic, we're human. And even though our bodies are vulnerable, our souls need caretaking. And I think Charles' point about looking at the mental health impacts of this pandemic and figuring out how the arts have contributed to our resilience is going to be a powerful story. So I think you're absolutely right, Julia and Charles. Yeah, I am glad that you sort of brought that up because I, I really do think with art, design, production, culture infusing everything, um, we forget how much it brings to both self and community wellness. The shirt that I wear that puts me in a good mood, even if I'm not wearing pants. Somebody designed this shirt. So not wearing pants would put me in a good mood. I don't like the shirt. <laughs> Um, thank you all so, so much. Um, I'm going to start kind of wrapping it up. We're coming to the end of our time here. Um, but I did want to give each of you an opportunity kind of at the end to just share how the community can support you, whether you have a fundraising um, kind of campaign going on, um, something they can do if they can call their senator. Um, if you have any thoughts, um, I would just invite you to share how the community can support you in this moment. Anyone want to take it? Sure, I'll jump in there. I think the biggest way that uh, our community can support um, us as an institution is by supporting artists anywhere. You know, wherever you are, you know, give the gift of art making to somebody, you know, as a class, uh, as, um, as a, uh, you know, as a birthday gift, you know, an original work of art, whatever it is. Um, because I think um, A, original art reminds us that we're human. I think B, artist survival is foremost in my mind. If artists aren't earning an income, they sure as hell aren't gonna be buying a studio at Artisan's Asylum, right? So I guess my message would be support artists anywhere. That's a bit uh, sort of magical. So if folks are looking for something specific and you do want to support Artisans Asylum, um, we do have a capital campaign coming up because we've got a big move in the next year. In the middle of a pandemic, we're growing. We're going from 42,000 square feet to 52,000 square feet. So uh, reach out to ed at artisansasylum.com. Ask questions. We'll uh, dial you in. Awesome, thank you. Does anyone else wanna share something? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, so I already mentioned that we have an online gallery shop and that is a great way to directly support mudflat artists who are making beautiful things. The theme for October is Soups On, so it's featuring handmade bowls, just in time for those cold nights when you need to be eating soup. Hopefully you've made that with all the vegetables you grew in your garden this summer. Um, and we're also doing a fun, our annual fundraiser for, um, we do a, a new t-shirt design every year. This year it, uh, for 2020, it features um, our mascot parakeets, the Tuttles. And so um, the, those can get ordered online. So all of those things are on our website, which is mudflat.org and help support our organization, but also our artists. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Does anyone else wanna share? Are we all good? Sure, yeah, I can um, jump in. I think um, for us, there's multiple ways that the community can continue to support us. Um, I already mentioned Rooted. Um, we really, this is our pivot. And if you have a choice um, to buy your groceries um, with us, we'd really appreciate your support. This is what we're trying to do to stay afloat. Um, there really are, you know, they're local, um, delicious products and by 
buying them, you're not just supporting us, but you're also supporting many small businesses, um, small farms, um, some that are local, even to Somerville. Um, so we appreciate your support there. Um, we also have online ordering um, and you can call ahead so you don't have to wait. Um, so come check out what we have on offer at Rooted. Um, we also are really grateful for individual donations. And I'm also making a pitch right now um, for businesses to sponsor Rooted. So I have a lot of um, calls out to um, the business community um, in seeking um, sponsorships. So th those are welcome as well. And, you know, we also have our, our farmer's market season coming up. So I hope the community will come out um, in this different COVID format that we're going to have to do, but um, we still really need everybody's support. So thank you so much in advance. I'll just end by saying, um, I mentioned the Somerville Toy Camera Festival. It should hopefully be on uh, the revamped website. We'll have three exhibits open by the end of this month. I'm really excited. Uh, it was kind of a different format this year. We had three jurors who looked at the same pool of submissions. So there are going to be three separate exhibits by three separate jurors, but from the same group of artwork. So I'm really curious to see how that turns out. Um, it, and I think it, it, it says a lot about the whole um, sort of curatorial process that people don't normally think of, you know, and I think it's a learning experience both for artists and for other gallerists to look at something like this, because I think it shows you that there's no good or bad or right or wrong art. It's just kind of what fits in somebody's vision when they're putting an exhibit together like that. Um, because of COVID, we this year waived our normal entry fee, which uh, it actually cost the Nave Gallery money this year to put this together because I really didn't feel it was a time to ask artists to pay money. So we waived the entry fee. We waived our normal, um, we normally take a commission if there's any sales. So we're just having the artists deal with anybody who's interested in purchasing directly and they get 100% of their sales except we did ask them to think about making a small donation to either the Welcome Project, Food for, for All, or a local nonprofit in their own community, since we had people from all over the world doing this. And I just think that's just how we're going to get through the next year or so is we all have to support one another. Um, and don't forget the musicians, man, all the musicians I know and all the gigs they've lost, like go to band camp, throw some money at them. Like I have one person that he does something every Wednesday and I always throw some money, even though usually my Wi-Fi is not working well enough for me to hear what he's playing. But, you know, it, 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 we got to get through this and it's just a little bit of money. But if we all can help one another, it's going to work somehow. Yeah, and I would just jump on that with this whole idea of uh, grassroots. If you are an artist in Somerville listening to this, you know, look for the upcoming town halls, uh, look for the messaging, because it really is numbers and people. As Susan talks about, you know, supporting local, that is us. And so the, the need to uh, come together so that our voices are heard more distinctly, I think is super important. Um, as well as supporting your artist friends and neighbors. Absolutely. Um, thank you all so much. Um, as bleak as it may be, uh, it, it's a really a pleasure to speak with all of you and hear about the amazing work that you're doing um, for our community and in your own communities. Um, so thank you all um, to the viewers. You can stream this video on summervillemedia.org. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next time.